like when we issued the challenge that you got your itch scratched just now, Amen. right? Isn't that awesome? Awesome. God is so, 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 so good. And he is so worthy to be praised. I feel like we should just keep on singing all day. I don't know if my voice would take it. Got a little bit of a cold this morning. My throat's a little itchy. I'm on, I'm on my second service, y'all. So you see, I got here early, so my throat's about done. But I think it's going to be neat in, in heaven that we get to just be around the throne and do what we just did for the last 15. You can do that forever. And uh, you don't get a sore throat. It's kind of cool. We get to just sing forever. And so, uh, but you just got to practice that. And uh, it's so good. It's so, good. so grateful for that testimony with, with Tanner and Nicole and the kids and just seeing God's provision and uh, he is such a good father and he loves to take care of his kids and so if you've ever been in that wave of grace, that tidal wave of grace, you know what I'm talking about, it's so sweet and so good and I want that for all of you so badly. Well this morning I want to uh, invite you to open up your Bibles, how many people have their Bible with them, let me see their Bibles, let me see your Bibles. Awesome. I love Bibles. Bibles are good. Okay, so open up your Bible uh, to Acts chapter 6. And uh, really where we're going to mine this morning is Acts 6, 8 through uh, Acts 7, verse 60. I'm not going to read all of it uh, unless God really lays it on my heart in that moment that I have to. But I don't think I'm going to read it all. Um, but what I want to do while you're turning there is is to kind of recap what we've been doing since the middle of this of september and since the middle of september we started this series called to the ends of the earth and we're studying through uh the book of acts and uh, we've been doing it in detail I'm not going to get through it for for quite some time i hope you're, you're enjoying it has it blessed your heart in any way has it it's Amen. blessed me in, 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 in researching and and studying and, and um passing it on to you and um the, the, the book of Acts, this study, here's, here's the deal with the book of Acts. So Luke, he writes the Gospel of Luke. It's the, the, the third book of the New Testament. And so he writes this book to this dude, Theophilus, so that he would understand who Jesus is. So if you read through the Gospel of Luke, and we study through that for about a year and a half here at Revolution. It's all on our YouTube channel. If you want to go check out that resource, please feel free to do so. It's all there, every single message. But what Luke does is he unpacks for this Theophilus and then therefore for us, like who Jesus is and what he taught and what he said and what he did and where he went and all that. So he teaches us all about Jesus, right? And then the book of Acts is a follow-up letter to the same dude from the same guy. And what it does is it is exactly what the title is. It's the acts of these early believers. It's their response to everything that you saw in the Gospel of Luke, right? So in the Gospel of Luke, he tells us this is who Jesus is, this is what he taught, this is what he said, this is where he, this is where he went, this is what he expects of his followers. <coughs> in the book of Acts, we see how the people respond, how they act in response, and as a result of this response, the church expands to fulfill Jesus' promise that he made way back in Matthew 16, 18, that I'm going to build my church and all the powers of hell are not going to stop it. And so, and then he goes on in, in the book of Acts, and the, right at the beginning he said, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to come. Remember when the Holy Spirit fell on the church? Remember that? Do you remember that? Pentecost, right? Holy Spirit drops on the church. He says, and now you're going to be empowered from upon high, and you're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that's like right where they were and then to the next area, to the next area, and the next area, to the ends of the earth. And so we're watching how this unpacks so we can learn. And what we said at the beginning and what I'll say again is the reason that we're studying it. Here's what we're, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to see two things. We're trying to see truths shared. We want to see the truths that are shared in the book of Acts so we know what our faith is. We want to know who Jesus is and then also examples shown. We're looking for truths shared and then examples shown. Why? So we can follow in those footsteps so we can expand the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. And listen, hell does not like that. Right. Amen. Right. It, it does not like that. And hell 
is going to try to stop that at every opportunity. And listen, we all, from Herb all the way over to, to, to Mama, oh, thanks for being here, Mama. Who's that dude next to you there? It's my son. <laughs> we look alike. So, um, <laughs> so, 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 um, I can't believe you haven't just, just run right over to that table. I, okay. Um, and so totally wrecked my train of thought. Jesus, right? Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. So, um, so here's the thing. We all experience hell every single day. We, we, we experience it. I experience it big time on Sunday. Anybody experience hell on Sunday? Yep. Isn't it kind of weird how that happens? Like, 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 like God wants us to gather, right? That's what God wants. He wants. He says, don't neglect gathering together. Some make a habit of doing, right? And, and so it's amazing, though. Even though he says, okay, I want you to just get, this is just one example. I want you to gather, right? And the early church did it when? Every day. Every single day, okay? So God's like, I want you to gather to what? To encourage one another, right? But it's amazing how on this day that we've selected as the only day we're going to go and gather, which is pathetic and lame, but that's beside the point. But, love you. Um, but, isn't it funny how on that day, you get sick. Somebody calls and says, I got tickets to SeaWorld. It's the only day you can use them. Right now. <laughs> my family's my family shows up. See my Tanner and Nicole, they love Jesus. They wouldn't show up on Sunday morning. That's just not what they would do, right? Because they don't want to mess us up, right? And if they did, they'd be like, When are we leave to go to church? But family shows up, tickets are available, right? I'm sick, I'm tired, I'm this, I'm that. You know what's amazing? This is so crazy. I don't know if you're if you've seen this before, but I meet a lot of people in, in when a pastor in a church, I meet a lot of people that are hurting, right? And a, and, a, and a real frequent pain is that lack of work, lack of money, right? That's, that's, that's running rampant through the church. And it's amazing how when people that you meet in church are in that position where they're out of work and out of money and they need help, it's, it's like all the time they get hired, but guess when they're needed? It's incredible. Like it, I just sit and I just watch this stuff, right? I don't take stats in the notebook, but I don't, like they they need a, like overtime is available on Sunday. Never on like a Tuesday night. No, that would never happen, right? Never, right? Sunday mornings when overtime is available, uh, I get hired. But you need to work on Sunday and Wednesday nights, and an occasional Monday. Really? Like, it happens all the time. I'm not making this stuff up. It happens all the time. And guess what? We pray on Monday night. We have Bible study on Wednesday night. We meet on Sunday morning for church. And those are the days that they get hired on for. Hell does not like when God's people gather to encourage one another. He, he is ticked off right now that you're sitting here. Throwing it out here. Big chance. Rolling the dice. How many people were challenged with something this morning that tried to keep him from coming. Look at this. Half of you. Thank you for pressing in. Thank you for not taking the bait of Satan and showing up. Right? Thank you for doing that. Right? Don't neglect. Listen, God wants us to gather and Satan don't. Bottom line. Right? That, that's, that's the way it works. He doesn't like it. And this demonic presence that you experience on Sunday mornings, right? It's all, it's all over and through. It's saturated into the book of Acts. It's everywhere. But in the book of Acts, we see that God and his people press through all that junk and they win. And the church grows. And the gospel makes it after 6,500 miles and 2,000 years, it makes it to Leesburg where you're sitting right here today and it's still progressing. Amen. Right? And it's all because of the example we see in the book of Acts. They press through, and this is what happened as a result. Now listen, I want to I want to offer you an observation that I have, and, and maybe it's your observation, maybe it's not. But this is where I want to start here this morning. I, I, I see when I uh, talk to people and I see on social media and stuff like that, that, that the body of Christ in America is super concerned with its right to worship being threatened. Would you agree? Uh, that's an issue. It's talked about all the time. Like, our rights have been taken away. Um, the government's infringing. They're encroaching upon 
the church and they're trying to tell us what we can preach and what we can teach and submit your sermon and make sure it's approved and and if you preach certain sections of the Bible right that's a that's hate speech and if you do that we're gonna strip away your tax-exempt 501c3 status like the church is super concerned with our right to worship don't you agree all the time okay well, I want to offer you a fresh perspective on how to look at that, and it's probably going to tick most of you off in this room until you realize that what I'm telling you is right. Okay? And that's not arrogant. This is truth. Okay? This can, here's my perspective, and you tell me if you agree or not. But I think that this concern for the encroachment of religious freedom is rooted more in American pride that says, don't tell me what to do, this is a free country, than it is rooted in our love for Jesus and our passion and desire to see his kingdom progress. That's what I think. Now listen, here's why I think that. In the early church that we're reading in the book of Acts, right? They were told, do not preach Jesus or we'll kill you. So it's, it's, it's like it's in a hostile environment. And when did they meet? Every single day. Where did they meet? At the temple. And then where else? At home. Right? Everywhere. Every day. And how many of them did that? All of them. Right? In a hostile environment where they're told not to. Okay? But here in our country, the place we're fighting for freedom to, to worship Him. Right? In a nation that is free, and in most situations even, no, we don't see in the news anymore. But we can worship, it's totally fine. Go to church, it's all good. There are 327 million people in our country. So let's talk about our freedom. There's 327 million people in our country. About 70% of them self identify as a Christ follower. That means they follow Christ, okay? 70%. That means 239 million people. Now, we're not Catholic here at this church, but for this stat, I'm just going to group in Catholics and Protestants, Evangelical Christians, those who, they might practice it differently. You, listen, email someone else. I don't care about your opinion about it right now. This is just for this. I'm just talking about people who said Jesus is Lord, okay? So all of those people, 70%, 239 million now, in our freedom, in a country that is free to worship and most often encouraged to worship, 80% of those people do not read their Bible ever except what the preacher puts on the screen. 80% of them. And listen, less than a quarter of them, 22%, go to church once a week. Once a week a week in our freedom we don't worship him ever okay ever and the 22 percent of the people that go to church every week they're praised all the time listen in the book of acts when they're told do not worship christ when did they do it who did it right and now when we have freedom to do it and encouraged to do so, less than a quarter of us read our Bible and actually go to church once a week. Pathetic. This is the idea of a revolution. The revolution church idea is not coming up like Moses had this great idea and so he started a church 10 years ago. No. The great idea is the Bible, like that we would actually live as Christ followers are supposed to live, and we don't. The only ones that are at church every day are paid staff. That's awful. That's awful. So the shift in the status quo is to change that. And I can't make you do it, but I can certainly encourage you with God's word to do so. More people are concerned with personal freedom than they are with advancing Christ's kingdom. That is true. And the, fact, the numbers do not 
lie. It is true. But listen, loved ones, here's part of the perspective change. Persecution produces progress. Persecution produces progress, and we are exhausting our Christian resource fighting for freedom to worship when all the while we're killing the church with this. We're using resource, instead of, of fighting for freedom that we will not use, we should be preaching our guts out to everyone that we meet. That's what we should be doing. Persecution produces progress. In our text that I want to read to you this morning in Acts chapter 6 and maybe some of 7 and 8 is a perfect picture of how persecution produces progress. So, are you in Acts chapter 6? You got your Bible there? Okay, Acts chapter 6, and we'll see uh, in verse 8. I want, to, I want to read this to you. So they, the, the Christians were grumbling, complaining because unfair treatment of food distribution. They, they, they um, appoint these guys to lead um, the, the, the food distribution uh, amongst those that are hurting and poor and hungry. These would um, church experts and history would say these were the first deacons of the church. And one of these guys was Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, great dude, right? And so verse 8, look here. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. Uh, they were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders and the teachers of religious law. So everyone gets fired up, right? So they, are, uh, they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. That's the Sanhedrin. The lying witnesses said, this is what their accusation was. This is what, their, this is what they, their claim was. They said, this man, Stephen, is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen, right? They're just staring at him, kind of ticked off. It says, because his face became as bright as an angel's. I don't know if that translation is actually even really good. Most of the other translations don't say anything about bright as an angel. But in any case, they're staring at him. He's got their attention big time, and they're not happy at all. So you see there, um, if you look the verse before that, the one, we didn't read it, but if you look at the, the verse just before what we read, it says that the church is experiencing great, great growth, great increase. So things are good. The church is expanding. And so, of course, right, hell doesn't like that. So here it comes, right? Here comes opposition. Here comes pressure. Here comes persecution from hell, right? And, and listen, here's the thing about hell. Hell don't play fair. Hell don't play fair, right? You think you're in it and, you're in, and you can compete with what they do. What you do and what hell does, two totally different things. Hell doesn't play fair. Look what they do in verse 10, 11. They start lying. They, they, they appoint some guys, uh, hire them, if you will. Hey, go in there and lie about this guy. And, and so that's what hell will do. That's what, Satan is the, is the father of lies. He's been lying since the beginning. Hey, did, did God really say that? Did he really say that? Right, he's a liar, right? And so his people are lying, and why are they lying? Look at the next verse in verse 12, why? To rouse the people up, to get them stirred up, to get them excited, to get them fired up. See, that's what Satan does. He's been doing it since the beginning. Satan, he messes with your emotions. And, and all of us are guilty of that, myself included. My emotions get the best of me. Now, are my emotions real? Yes. But are they based on reality? Most of the time, no, they're not. Satan messes with emotions and Jesus builds with truth. That's the difference between the two of them, okay? And, and, and the Bible is 
filled with this stuff. We're a ch- Listen, I, I know we're a, well, there's a lot of things that we're not, okay? But we're a, ch- we're, a, we're a truth church, okay? We're a truth church. And, and that's, that's what I've been charged to do is to tell you the truth. Whether you like it or not, we tell the truth, okay? Here, listen to this. 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the church is the pillar and the foundation of what? The what? The truth, okay? Let me give you opportunities to, to, to help me out with this, okay? It's the pillar and foundation of the the truth, Ephesians 6, 14, I could rattle these off all morning, says to resist the enemy in the time of evil, you must stand your ground putting on the belt of truth. See this? Look, this morning my button's gone. And if I didn't have my belt on, we'd all be in trouble in here, right? Think about, this is the imagery, right? The, bo- the, the belt is the thing that holds everything together, right? What holds everything together? The truth, the truth, right? There's an attack in this country on the truth. Listen, the truth does not change, ever. It never changes. The standard of truth is a standard only because it's unchanging, right? The, 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 the Bible you have in your hand is the truth, and we stand on it. The, the, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. That means we embrace the truth, we live by the truth, and we proclaim the truth without apology, all the time, okay? That's what we are. We go on. Jesus tells us in John 4, 24, to worship in spirit and truth, right? You can't, listen, you can make up your own God all you want. It doesn't mean you're worshiping God. We know who God is because he's told us who he is in his truth, right? That's what we need to know. We need to know the truth. Immersed in God's word all the time, it is true. The apostle John tells us, he, he writes to some unnamed lady in Second John, verse 4, he says, How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, right? And then again, in Third John, verse 4, he says, I could have no greater joy, write it to someone else, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my spiritual children, the ones that I led to the Lord, the ones that I discipled, are following the truth truth okay and finally jesus says in john 8 32 that his teachings are truth and the truth will set you free okay we are being the truth is being attacked and and if you attack the truth right you kill the church and so we need churches and that means pastors and elders and deacons and congregations, that means all of us that will contend for the truth, okay? Never, ever stop telling the truth, whether people like it or not, okay? That's what the church needs to do. They don't need to be worried about protecting ourselves so we have the right to tell the truth. No, just do what? Just tell the truth, right? Just tell the truth. That's all you need to do. But here back in our story, the problem with these people, if you go, if you look real quick in Acts 7, verse 51, it says that they were deaf to the truth. They just wouldn't listen. I I know what it says, I know what you're telling me, and I just don't care. I'm the one who decides what's true. I'm the one who's going to decide what I'm going to do. It's a couple years ago, what was on? Oprah said, everybody needs to establish their own truth. How could that be? If, if Tabitha, if you thought two plus two was four, but Tyreek, you said two plus two is five, and two plus two is six, and two plus two is seven, and we just go on down the line, we just come up with a new answer. What are we going to do? Do you see the confusion and all that stupidity? There has to be a standard. There has to be a truth, right? There has to have an unchanging standard of truth, and the, and the truth is being attacked by our culture, and we need, to, we need to fight against that by just simply telling the truth. But some people are just deaf to it. They don't want to hear it, okay? But that doesn't change what you do. You tell the truth all the time, okay? So all the people here in our story, all the people, they get their emotions roused, it says, right? And then Stephen gets arrested, 
And so greater levels of persecution, right? More persecution comes. It's not just that they're angry. They're not just shaking a fist at him. Now they're actually arresting him. And so I would just say there's more reason to quit now. More reason to back it down a notch, right? He gets arrested, and that's what persecution is intended to do. Persecution is is intended to do simply this. Stop the progress of the church. That's it. That, that's what it says. It says right here that there was great growth, right? And all of a sudden, boom, here comes persecution. Shut this guy up, man. He's preaching. People are getting saved. People are getting converted. They're following Christ. Shut this dude up. And persecution is intended to make progress stop. And so what does Stephen do? He just tells the truth. He doesn't stop. And so for the next 50 verses, I won't read it. For the next 50 verses... He just tells the truth. See, they're saying, you're not really one of us. You're bad-mouthing the temple. You're bad-mouthing Moses, right, against our our foundation of this Judaism. You're you're ripping it to shreds. You're not one of us. And so for the next 50 verses, he kind of tells the cliff notes, the history of the Jewish people and God and how they interact. He talks about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, talks about Moses being born. He talks about Moses on Mount Sinai with the burning bush. He talks about Moses with with Israel at the Red Sea, how it opens. He talks about Mount Sinai when he gets the Ten Commandments, the life-giving words to pass on to the people. He talks about the golden calf that they worshipped down at the base. He talked about the tabernacle. He talked about Joshua. He talked about King David. He talked about Solomon. He just walks through the Old Testament with these people, and he actually quotes two direct quotes from two Old Testament prophets, the prophet Amos and the prophet Isaiah. He's actually just walking through the scriptures with them. And he's like, listen, I'm totally one of you. Like, you're making a false claim about me. That is not who I am. I would just offer you this, that Christianity is just completed Judaism. Okay, that's what it is. The Jewish faith said, listen, this is who God is, this is who my people are, and this is who the Messiah is going to be. And so that's all Stephen is saying. He's saying, listen, I'm a Jew just like you guys. This is that same Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, all that, all that stuff that you like and you believe and you follow it. I do too. I'm telling you the truth. I'm just like you. I'm all about God. But in verse 51, it changes a little bit. If you get your eye on your Bible, you'll see that there's a change in what he's saying just a little bit. But listen, I'm going to read what it says here in a second. But I would just tell you that Stephen, even though he transitions into verse 51, he never stops telling the truth. See, they like the other stuff that happened before them. They can embrace that. They had no no say in all that, right? It just happened. You either deal with it or you don't. But now he's talking about right now. He's talking about in your face right now. Right now where it involves you. Not what Moses did. He's awesome. What about you? And so look at verse 51. After he just walks through the Old Testament, quotes Isaiah, and then he says, you stubborn people, you're heathen at heart. Just think about this. Some translations say you're uncircumcised at heart. So they would would circumcise the male, right? They would chop off the end. That was a visible evidence that they were a Jew, right? So he's going up to the to the elite of the circumcision, and he's calling them heathens. That'll tick them off, right? I mean, but but, but listen, they're stubborn, they're rebellious, they're deaf to the truth. He, He said, listen, this is who I am all throughout the Old Testament, and this is the Messiah that I'm gonna bring to you, and you need to say yes to him, and they're saying no. So is he telling the truth? He's absolutely telling the truth, but the truth doesn't always feel good, right? Sometimes the truth hurts, and Stephen didn't stop telling the truth even though it hurts. And the reason why it hurts is because the truth calls you out, and it tells you what's wrong with you. And that's why the Bible says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to correct us and tell us what's right and wrong, and God uses it to prepare his people for every good work. 
The word of God, when you come to church, you're not always going to feel good. Sometimes it hurts because it's calling you out on your life. And there's a truth standard, and if you're not up to that, it's going to, 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 to rub you wrong. It's, it's this friction there. You don't like it. And I don't like it either, but now I have to tell you about it, so now you hate me. But that's just the way it is. I'm not going to back down from the truth. And so you see, verse 51 through 53, look what it says. You stubborn people, you're heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you, he's talking about Jesus, who you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. So he's like, listen, you have completely disobeyed God. This high religious people that you are, you know the Bible back and forth. You know what it says about this Messiah, and you don't want it. So is he telling the truth? He's telling the truth, but they don't like it. Right? So I said the truth hurts, right? Look at verse 54. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. And they shook their fist at him in rage. See, the truth hurts, doesn't it? The truth hurts. And listen, that's the response you're going to get from people who don't believe the truth. But what does that mean for you? Nothing. That means you still tell them, right? That means you still tell them. So I just want to say <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why you'll not come to church. There's a lot of reasons why you won't share your faith. There's a lot of reasons why you won't do the things that God has called you to do. You read in the Bible. None of it's a mystery. I'm not making any of this new stuff up. You know what you're supposed to be doing, right? Most of you guys have read most of the Bible, if not all of it. You know what you're supposed to be doing, but you don't do it. And I don't do it half the time, too. But I just want you to compare your situation and the reason why you don't do it, the reason why you resist the Holy Spirit, versus Stephen. At the hands of these same people, these leaders, Jesus, who never did anything wrong, was stripped down naked, spit on, slapped, and spiked to a cross to be killed by these people. And those same people arrested Peter and John previous to this, in previous chapters. We read about that. We studied about that. These same people arrested Peter and John and had them flogged, whipped almost to death. And so I'm thinking at this point, this would probably be a great time for Stephen to maybe tone it back a notch, right? He's confronting these same people that are proven that they don't want to tolerate this and they're going to whip and beat and kill you. We'll look at verse 55, just walking right through it. What's the first word there? But... So I don't know about your Bible. Look up here. My Bible says, but Stephen realized that it was about to go wrong. And so he lightened up because he might get hurt or he might get in trouble. Does your Bible say that? Your Bible doesn't say that? I thought mine was a weak translation. I thought maybe some of you King James people might have something different. No, none of them say that, right? You know what all of them say? All of them say the, say the same thing. Stephen's comfort, his freedom, and his life took a back seat to the kingdom of God being advanced. That's what they all say. Every single one of them, right? And here's why. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. See, the Bible says, how are we supposed to run the race with endurance that God has set before us? By setting our eyes on Jesus. Set your eyes on Jesus so you can finish the race and finish it well. And that's exactly what Stephen did. He had all that stuff in front of him that was going down, right? It was about to go down. But he didn't look at his problem. He didn't look at the persecution. He looked at Jesus. And because he was looking at Jesus, he was able to utter out of his mouth in and, and total jeopardy of his life. He said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man, Jesus, standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. They put their hands over their ears. I can't believe he's saying that. They went crazy. Eyes on the prize always produces progress. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize all the time. We need to do that. Quit looking at your problems. 
Isn't it kind of strange, though, how persecution produces progress? It just doesn't make any sense, really, at all. Persecution is intended to stop progress. But persecution of Jesus and his disciples prior to this story, this didn't stop Stephen from his mission, did it? Isn't that weird? I mean, here's, here's the enemy, right? He, he's killing he's, he's killing Jesus. Kill Jesus. Shut him down, right? And what does he do? He, he resurrects, right, and, and launches a church. And then, and then you they persecute the, the believers, right? Arrest them. And, and whip them and beat them and tell them no and, and demand they never speak in Jesus' name again. And what do they do? Get worse, right? You can't stop these people. The persecution didn't stop. And listen, Stephen being arrested and killed for preaching Jesus didn't stop the mission like hell wanted it to either. It did shut up one mouth. I will say that. It, it tells us that Stephen gets stoned. They drag him out of, out of the center of town, and they start whipping rocks at him until he's dead. So they did shut up one mouth, and it does say, if you look over in chapter 8, it says a great, in verse 1, a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. So here comes the pressure, and what does it say? And all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So it shuts up the mouth of Stephen, who has great influence. People are listening. It shuts him up, and it disperses the crowd. So mission accomplished. We got rid of that problem. It did make the church scatter. But instead of running and hiding to protect their own life and their comfort, Look at verse 8, chapter 8, verse 4. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Do you find it slightly odd that they went to Judea and Samaria? What did Jesus say in Acts 1-8? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what the enemy tries to do by shutting it down, they shut the mouth of one, and while they did that, they empowered thousands to preach everywhere that they went. Right? Mission accomplished. Jesus always wins. Right? The enemy's thinking, let's shut this dude up. Right? Let's kill him. Persecution produces progress. Okay? So let's just bring this real close to you, okay? Let's get it out of the heavens and just real close to you right now. We're almost done, believe it or not. It's a Christmas gift for you. When we read the story of Stephen, how many people in here have read the entire story of Stephen? He preaches like this, and then he gets stoned, and, and they kill him, right? Okay. So, so when, when we read the story of Stephen's stoning, of, his, of this obvious persecution of the church of Jesus Christ, does it make you want to shrink back? Or honestly, does it make you want to get after this kingdom thing even more? Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. This is your chance to yell out in church. Does it make you want to shrink back when you see what could happen? Or does it make you fired up to even want to pursue the kingdom and advance it even more? Tell me. Get a little more fired up, right? Right? See, hell tries to, to shut us down. And when they do that, we get fired up. This is what happens, right? This is what happens all the time, right? Persecution is, is intended to produce paralysis in the church. Okay, that's what the enemy wants. Shut them up and shut them down. But listen, loved ones, that doesn't work on truth people. Okay, that doesn't work on truth people. That's emotionally driven, but we stand on what? The truth. The truth, okay? The truth. People who know and live by the truth and have their eyes set on Jesus Christ 
They don't back down when persecution comes. Their lives are not about them. Their lives are about Jesus and his mission to build the church. And that's the shift in the status quo that we need. That's what revolution really is all about, okay? That's what a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo looks like. It's, it's people of Christ making a decision of what's most important to them. Their own comfort, their own stuff, their own agenda, their own schedule, their own life, or Jesus Christ and his mission. And it's not a decision that you make with words. <laughs> it's a decision that gets fleshed out in your life. So earlier on when I said that the most dedicated Christ follower, 22% of Christ followers go to church once a week. I'm just asking you, and I'm not telling you you got to come here every single day. I'm not. But just hear me out. Being devoted to the kingdom of God and advancing it, does 22% of all believers that say they're Christians going to church once a week, does that even smell like devotion in any way? Think about, listen, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Think about what you do. Think about your time. Think about your prayer life. Think about your time in God's word. Think about your financial commitments. Just think about the way you serve. All of that. The church was told not to do this. And they all did it every day. And look what happened. And here we are fighting for our freedom for a freedom that we will not use. So I'm just telling you, church, we need to make a decision of what's most important. Fighting for freedom that we won't use or advancing the kingdom of God. We need a shift in our status quo. That's what we're doing right here, right now. That's why you're here, to listen to this, to get your eyes off of yourself to get your eyes on Christ. You were given his Holy Spirit when you believed. Boldly preach. If we'll do that, if we'll make that decision, the kingdom will progress even in the face of resistance, even in the face of pressure, even in the face of persecution. The church will advance. And I want our church to be part of that. It's called you into that story, okay? Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you, Lord, that because of your son's work on the cross, we are in your presence even right now, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. Lord, you have called us into the mission of expanding your kingdom to the ends of the earth. We are part of that redemptive story. And we are challenged, God, by so many things that would distract us from such a task. But that is the task for which you've called us to. That is the task that we are saved to. And so, Lord, we, some of us would like to, just right now, afresh, just rededicate ourselves to the mission of Christ, to expanding your kingdom to the ends of the earth. And that's gonna look different for all of us, Lord, and we understand that. And what our levels of commitment look like are gonna be different, they vary, Lord, we understand that. But all of us are called to a complete devotion to the kingdom of God. So Lord, don't let the enemy mess with our emotions and feel condemned for our lack of participation, but let your Holy Spirit lift us by convicting us to do better right now. That's what our desire is, Lord. And now, Lord, as we, as we offer up our tithes and our offerings to you, Lord, 
We would pray that you would speak to us in this, le- in this area of devotion to your kingdom. And let our giving reflect devotion to your kingdom. And so speak to us now and let us know how we personally would give toward advancing your kingdom so that more people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ and his saving work on the cross. That's why you called our church here, Lord, to pass on that information, to pass on that good news. And it's in that that we invest right now. Jesus will listen to you now. Loved ones, there'll be people coming through the room in just a few moments with a basket. You can also give in the box.